worry. Kia ora koutou katoa from here in Auckland today where I chaired a virtual cabinet meeting this morning to discuss our progress on stamping out COVID-19 and to review current alert level settings in Auckland and the rest of New Zealand. I'll provide more detail around those discussions and related announcements in a few moments. Um, but first, I'll let Dr Bloomfield give an outline of our case details for today. Then I'll proceed to give announcements on alert levels. Then we'll move to questions relating to COVID. After that, I'll give an update on the Auckland Harbour Bridge and the status of engineering work there. But at that point, we'll release Dr Bloomfield. But for now, I'll hand over to you, Dr Bloomfield. Thank you, Prime Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. Nice to be here in Tamaki Makaurau for today's um, media conference. And I also wanted to say kia ora, uh, because it's also New Zealand Sign Language Week, so happy New Zealand Sign Language Week. Uh, there are no new cases of COVID-19 in New Zealand today. I want to, though, start with an update on the case we reported over the weekend. Uh, this is a man who is a recent returnee from India who completed his stay in managed isolation and has subsequently tested positive for COVID-19. First, uh, I would just like to say that we have had over 50,000 people return safely to New Zealand since our managed isolation system started on the 9th of April. Modelling shows us that the scenario that presents the lowest risk of anyone getting through managed isolation and having an infection under our current settings is a 14-day stay plus testing at days 3 and 12, uh, along with very strong infection prevention control procedures. That is the system we have. This case and his family members should be commended for the steps they took after the man became unwell following his departure from managed isolation. He completed the 14 days and returned two negative tests, however remained alert to his health and when he developed symptoms he sought advice quickly from Healthline was tested and he self-isolated, as did members of his family. This is exactly the sort of vigilance that will help us keep ahead of the virus. And I would like to thank him again and his family for their quick thinking and all indications so far as that this has present, prevented the virus from spreading further. Everyone who has been through managed isolation on return to New Zealand, even if they have been well and have returned negative tests before their release from managed isolation, needs to remain conscious of the symptoms of COVID-19 in case they develop an inf uh, their infection after they have left. And of course these are the symptoms that we should all be vigilant for and seeking a test if we develop them. Three neighbours of the man who were identified as close contacts have remained in self-isolation and their tests, their initial tests, have returned negative. Passengers from the charter flight from Christchurch Airport to Auckland are being contacted and assessed uh, and there are a total of 86 people who were on that flight. They were all people who had completed their managed isolation period in Christchurch. The people from the first nine rows who sat nearest to the case, who was in, uh, he was in row four, have been asked to self-isolate and have been tested and the results of this testing are coming through today. In terms of how the man became infected, that is still under investigation and most importantly we remain open-minded on this. He could have been infected in India before departure and had, have a, had a very long and unusual period of, of incubation. This is rare but it can happen. He may well have been infected on the flight on the way to New Zealand uh, between India and Nandi or between Nandi and Christchurch and there have been eight other cases confirmed from that flight. Genomic sequencing has already linked this man's uh, version of the virus to that of two other cases from that flight. Four cases have been ruled out as being linked and two are still being sequenced. Other possible scenarios is he may have been infected during his time in managed isolation and the CCTV footage of his time there is being reviewed to check. Or he could have become infected on the charter flight from someone else who had left the MIQ and was returning to Auckland. We are not ruling out any possibilities or speculating on one or other scenario at this point, but are working to get to the bottom of it. 
On to the wider numbers for today. There are 40 people now isolating in the Auckland quarantine facility who have been infected in the community or who are family members. 17 of them are cases, the balance are household contacts. There are three people in hospital today with COVID-19, one each in Auckland City, Middlemore and North Shore hospitals, and all three patients are on a general ward in isolation. Since uh, the August the 12th, when this Auckland outbreak uh, started, the, our contact tracing team has identified 3,989 close contacts, of which 3,978 have been contacted, are self-isolating at the moment, and we are in the process of contacting the rest. That is those who still need to be in self-isolation. Many will have finished their 14-day period. There are nine further previously reported cases that are now considered recovered, so our total number of active cases is 62, and of those, 29 are imported cases that were identified in managed isolation, and 33 are community cases. Our total number of confirmed cases today remains at 1,464, and finally yesterday our laboratories processed 3,568 tests, and our grand total completed to date is 914,421 tests. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bloomfield. As you can see, our actions collectively have managed to get the virus under control. With no new cases in the country today and no new cases for seven days linked to the Auckland cluster, we are in a strong position to make our next move down our alert settings. It's now been three weeks since we moved Auckland to what we have called level 2.5 and kept the rest of New Zealand at alert level 2. In that time, there had been an additional 38 cases linked to the Auckland cluster. And tragically, there have also been two deaths, both devastatingly within the same family. These deaths are a reminder of just how serious this virus is, and today I want to acknowledge their whānau's huge loss and reiterate their pleas to others to follow with the plans that we have all set out as a nation. We have taken a cautious approach because it saves lives, but also because it means our economy is more open than that of nearly any other country in the world, even with our current level two restrictions. Since we restarted domestic travel on Monday 31 August, we have carried out 155,189 tests throughout the country of which 84,493 were in the Auckland region. Pleasingly, these have not resulted in a single positive result showing the virus has not spread beyond Auckland and the four cases linked to the cluster in Tokoroa. This reinforces our approach was the correct one. By moving swiftly to alert level three in Auckland, we contained the outbreak in Auckland and prevented spread of the virus to other parts of New Zealand. Our response safeguarded the health of New Zealanders while allowing the economy to operate at near normal levels. Looking at the status of the rest of the world, I think we've all seen by now that there is no costless response to COVID, no matter what your strategy is. Having said that, for New Zealand, the GDP figures for the June quarter out last week paint a more positive picture than some had expected. And the preview shows that for the quarter we're currently in, we are projected to see growth. We know that the more our economy can be open with low or no levels of the virus, the better our long-term economic picture. So then to the decision. Our good case numbers and confidence in the management of the virus means we can proceed with the decisions we indicated would take place a week ago. For Auckland, that means we have accepted the recommendations of the Director General of Health to move to full alert level two arrangements from 11.59 p.m on Wednesday, September 23. This means gatherings of 100 people will be permitted from Wednesday, 11.59 p.m. The reason for the delay is, of course, to make sure that the orders for those provisions can be drafted. The rest of New Zealand will move to level one from 11.59 p.m. tonight, Monday, September 21. And that's because we were able to, in advance, gazette um, uh, and draft the orders for that alert level change as we anticipated them at the last Cabinet meeting. Level 2 for Auckland will be in place for 14 days, or one transmission cycle, meaning Cabinet will meet again on Monday, October 5, to review those settings. If we remain on track, it would then be our intention to consider moving alert levels 
from Wednesday, October 7. Again, this is all conditional on us continuing as we are now. Some may query the cautious approach we are taking. It's worth noting that the last time we moved to Level 1, we did so after no cases for 14 days and only two cases in the full month we were at Level 2. Also, analysis completed for the Ministry of Health suggests that by the end of this month, there is still a 50-50 chance of having eliminated COVID once again. That is cause for us not to get ahead of ourselves and to remain vigilant. For this reason, we need people in Auckland to continue to stay home if they are sick and get a test, even if it is just a sniffle or a cough. Scan into places with the COVID app or keep a good record of where you are and where you've been so we can increase the speed of our contact tracing. Continue to wear face coverings. With these settings, anyone in Auckland will still need to wear a face covering on buses, trains and ferries in the city because, of course, we are still at alert level two. For air travel, face coverings will be required on any planes that are going to, from or through Auckland. This is now, of course, as I say, standard practice for alert level two settings. We also ask people to wear a face covering in situations where they're unable to maintain physical distancing. And you're from Auckland and travelling outside, please take your alert level settings with you. And that includes when it comes to large scale mass gatherings. For everyone else outside of Auckland, we still have asks for you as well. Please continue to use the COVID app. Maintain good hygiene practices. Stay home and get tested if sick. And if you are travelling on a plane that isn't travelling in or out of Auckland, you are not required to wear a mask, but we do still encourage it. For your safety and for the safety of those around you, you should consider doing the same for all interregional travel as well. Now that the rest of the country is back at level one freedoms from 11.59 p.m. tonight, we want to stay there. So these actions are a small price to pay to ensure that we can maintain these settings for as long as possible. Finally, I want to conclude today with an update on the future. I'm often asked what will make a difference to our border settings and a full return to normal. One of the major factors will be a vaccine. As a cabinet, we approved a vaccine strategy and significant funding to support it in May. I can now report that ministers have agreed to enter into a legally binding agreement for the option to purchase approved COVID-19 vaccines for up to 50% of the population of New Zealand, Tokelau, Cook Islands and Niue. This will take place via the global COVAX facility, co-led by Gavi, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and the WHO which aims to accelerate the development and manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines and to guarantee fair and equitable access for every country in the world. The COVAX facility ensures that COVID-19 vaccines are equitably distributed to every participating country worldwide. This is one of a number of key steps that we'll be taking to ensure New Zealanders have access to safe and secure COVID-19 vaccine when one becomes available. An initial $27 million investment will allow us to pull funding at the global level to accelerate the production of COVID-19 vaccines. This investment will give us the option to purchase from a diverse portfolio of vaccine candidates should any prove successful. By supporting the COVAX facility, we also demonstrate our commitment to ensuring vulnerable communities everywhere, including the Pacific, receive the vaccines they need. The funding allocation has come from the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund, all the more reason to ensure we retain funds in this kitty. More will be invested as our vaccine strategy rolls out. It is important to note though that we have many irons in the fire to ensure New Zealanders are at the front of a queue when a vaccine is safe and ready, and this is a very important part of it. You'll note though I've uh, mentioned that this is for 50% of our vaccination needs. That is because it will not be the only agreement that we enter into. Cabinet has set aside hundreds of millions of dollars for our vaccine strategy, and it is likely that we will have advanced purchase arrangements with a number uh, of different uh, research companies and pharmaceutical companies who are producing vaccines. The COVAX facility will just be one of them. Thank you, and we're now happy to take your questions. Prime Minister, why did you not link up New Ze uh, Auckland with the rest of New Zealand and, and just go tonight? Why wait till Wednesday? Uh, essentially, Auckland needs more time. Uh, whilst we have reasonable confidence that we are on the right track, 
Um, there is still a need in Auckland for that cautious approach. This was the centre of the outbreak and that's why that caution is required here. However, our view is that when it comes to the rest of the country, given that we have not seen that regional spread, we have enough confidence to lift those restrictions outside of Auckland. Those two cases yesterday, did they raise some concerns for you making the call today? No, no, not necessarily. In fact, what I would say is that they are again examples uh, of how with the system we have now, we are able to confidently manage cases as they arrive and under these circumstances, it has been contained. The individual in question has done everything right. We have contact traced, testing extensively, and those individuals are in isolation. Can I just clarify one point here? You mentioned the two deaths. Um, does that include Dr Joe Williams and those? Sorry, I was talking about the Tokoroa families, but of course Dr Williams, yes, was obviously earlier in the period as well. So three? Yes, three in total from this cluster. Forgive me, I should have put the disclaimer I was working with in the last period of time that we've had those two from Tokoroa. Uh, Prime Minister, just on the uh, alert level change in Auckland, why couldn't the order be drafted ahead of today so Auckland could move to alert level two tonight at the same country, at the same time as the rest of the country? Uh, so one consideration very legitimately for Cabinet even a week ago was the question over whether we'd be ready to move with 50 or to move with 100 for those mass gathering limits. Um, so that was a legitimate question for Cabinet. That was something that actually we've received the advice from the Director General and he was confident in mass gatherings up to 100. So rather than pre-drafting uh, and gazetting multiple options, we waited until the final day, had that confidence, and that means that we can lift to a wider alert level there. What, what pushed him over, what, sorry, Director General, what pushed you over the line to recommend 100 rather than 50? Thank you. Uh, yes, so just uh, on the orders, they require a 48-hour notice period and we had prepared the one and had it signed by the Minister for the Alert Level 1 change, which is today, but when Cabinet made the decision last week, they signalled that the Auckland change wouldn't happen till Wednesday. At this, at this time last week, our advice was probably to look more at the 50, but this, um, this run of effectively seven days without any additional cases as part of this Auckland outbreak uh, gave us a, a sense that there, it was safe to move to a, an upper gathering limit of 100, consistent with the usual alert level two arrangements. Were those the two options, either 50 or 100, or was there a higher band of 200 that was considered? No, no. We just uh, 100 is consistent with alert level two, and I think that's appropriate at this point. And is there any scenario under the current alert settings before the cabinet decides to change them again that the gathering limit may change, or is it just at 100 until alert level is changed? Yeah. Uh, sorry. So obviously the definition of alert level two does have the mass gathering limit at 100. Um, we are signalling now that we anticipate if we have another two weeks where we have fairly consistent results as we have over this past period that we would likely then see um, a lift in restriction level at that point. However, of course, we always reserve the right if there are issues um, or cases that give us cause for concern to revise those mass gathering limits equally in the other direction. So that would be your first step to revise the, the gathering limits rather than to step back up the alert levels? Yeah, look, and that is what we've done stepping into the alert level and it all very much depends on the scenarios. Um, we don't anticipate that. There's nothing to suggest that will be the case. So what we're trying to signal with some certainty is if we continue on on this path, it's likely in two weeks' time we will have that added confidence that that time and extra cycle of transmission will give us, and then we may be in a position to, to lift once more. Just on that, staying at level two because you think there may be unidentified community cases still? Um, no, as you will have heard me um, suggest, modelling that's been provided to the Ministry of Health still says that even with those settings till the end of the month, there's still a 50-50 chance that we've reached elimination so that just tells you that with time you can have greater confidence uh, and so it's always uh, I think um, right that we take a more cautious approach that means if you do see a case emerge that we're in a better position to be able to stamp it out much more quickly than if you don't have those alert level two settings. Will there be more support for those businesses that are particularly affected by the gathering limits in Auckland? Yeah, so the, of course, keep in mind that those who are most directly affected um, will be, for instance, those who are in events, um, those who may be, for instance, in our creative sector. What we've tried to do there is have very targeted initiatives to try and support those industries. We have a domestic events fund worth $10 million, which is being a 
um, through Minister Twyford. We have a $5 million domestic touring fund for those in the creative industries who may be affected. We even had a Make Good Fund for those who were impacted by New Zealand Music Month. There's a venues fund too that has been supporting those venues that are reliant on, on crowds over and above those 100. So those, that's the way that we've been supporting those sectors of the industry. However, I absolutely acknowledge that at level two, they are really the most effective because many other parts of our sector um, are able to operate even hospitality. So those businesses and some hospitality as well, should they expect that we will move back into level two? Well, of course, everything we do is based on our strategy of elimination uh, and is based around trying to keep us at the lowest alert level that we can so that we don't have restrictions. But the reason we have the alert level framework is that in the event we need to, we can use that to get on top of the virus. We actually even have data suggesting that actually in Auckland, even at level 2.5, the level of activity has been probably higher than most anticipate. Just on the case of managed isolation, yeah. Yeah. when a person leaves managed isolation? I'm confident that we will be able to answer the question of exactly what has happened in this case. Um, and while we do that, we should make sure that we investigate um, every element of it. Um, we do know that there is a very small, unlikely, but small chance that people can uh, uh, manifest with infection sometime later after being exposed, beyond 14 days. We've been having a conversation around whether or not we add in based on perhaps some risk profiling, um, a third test after isolation. But keep in mind, we have successfully managed 50,000 people coming through managed isolation without issue. So this would be an extra precautionary measure just to try and reduce down to zero some of that risk. So how serious for a person who flies back from a country, like in the hey. Or, or, for instance, if they were on a flight where someone had COVID, doing some risk profiling that just said, look, if, there's a, if there is a potential chance that someone's being exposed, even after a day three negative and a day 12 negative, what extra precautions can we take? We'll get some advice on that. Keep in mind, the individual in this case did everything right because when people are leaving, they're also given advice on what to look out for and what to do when they return home. So I imagine we'll, that over the maybe over the coming week, we'll leave that with the Ministry of Health. Uh, again, we're constantly using the evidence we build to add into our system to make it as robust as possible. This is being identified as a very small chance. But because we're one of the few countries in the world where we have such low numbers of cases, we are able to identify these issues and act on them. Would you have a third test for everyone or just those deemed high risk? And that, was, that would be something we'd seek some advice on. I think when, you're, when we know that you've been on a flight perhaps where there's been cases or you've come from a high risk country, perhaps we may wish to profile. Um, but we should keep in mind that we are processing a large number of people through who will, for instance, be coming from places where almost zero cases, for instance, Brisbane. So a question there as to whether or not you want to go through the additional effort of testing those of which the likelihood is very low. Is that something you were already looking at? Yes. Or has this case prompted that? We had, been, we had been, we constantly review the evidence and what we see from abroad and constantly assess. Uh, and so when we were uh, discussing the resurgence in New Zealand, one of the things we talked about was, had this been a potential, should we review having additional testing in place? Keep in mind of the genome sequencing we had available, nothing suggested that, that our resurgence came from anyone in MIQ. But as part of those conversations, we have been exploring the potential of this. Will you, will, will you rethink the length of time you spend in isolation centres or at home? So given, yeah, given the, given the very low number, so the advice I've recently been given is as low as 1%. Given that, that suggests um, that you would be better to incorporate an additional check and balance rather than asking 90, at the 99% it won't happen to to stay in MIQ for longer um, because that obviously it's a very small percentage. So we're, we're looking probably more at a testing, additional testing regime, but I should ask Dr Bloomfield to speak to it as well. Prime Minister, so yes, a couple of additional comments there. We had already been looking at, and our technical advisory group had been looking at, everything from pre-departure testing, day zero testing, and further testing after um, people have left managed isolation. 
I dare say in addition to the 14 days and the two tests, the other really important component here is very good infection prevention control procedures during the managed isolation stay. And so we have done an audit of all the facilities and they've had a report back on areas that could be improved on. So it's a constant learning and improvement game, but we will look particularly at the emerging evidence around incubation period and also, uh, also look at this idea of whether a further follow-up test or further post-MI uh, managed isolation actions might be indicated, for example, for people who have been on a flight where a case is actually identified subsequently in managed isolation. And so in such a uh, professor Mike Bay has um, been for an alert level 1.5, so basically mm -hmm. level 1 but with masks at large gatherings. Did you give any consideration to that? Uh, well, I'm in regular contact with uh, Professor Baker, actually I talked with him on the phone this morning. Uh, we, we gave some additional advice to uh, Cabinet around rec continuing to recommend and encourage the use of masks on internal flights, which the Prime Minister spoke to, even under Alert Level 1. I think one of the things I've been very encouraged by in uh, Alert Level 2 is how quickly people adopted the use of masks in public transport and on um, on flights and masks will be part of our response. They are now and they will continue to be so the more we sort of get used to using them and normalise their use, it's not something we are used to in this country. So <clears throat> it's been great to see the, um, that people have adopted them and taken on that on um, quite, uh, quite quickly. I think there was a question from you. Are you able to expand on the, uh, the Ministry of Health modelling that the Prime Minister referred to earlier uh, around uh, the fifty uh, sort of Yes. Don't, don't we have to go 28 days since the, the last case recovered? So, so there are two, two separate things there. First of all, the modelling is uh, every week we get an updated um, uh, report from Sean, uh, Professor Sean Hendy here in Auckland and his team. And I met with uh, Professor Hendy last week and we had a discussion about them. And actually, it's that team that's also modelled the different um, lengths of MI stay plus different testing regimes and landed on this 14 days plus days 3 and 12 as being the regime that has the very lowest risk of someone getting right through without being detected. On the elimination modelling, again, we've, we've sort of used the definition earlier in the year that we should go two full cycles, that is 28 days without cases of transmission, as being a sort of a definition of elimination of community transmission. And what Professor Hendy's modelling says is that by the end of this month, there's still about a 50% chance that we will have prevented we have, will have prevented any further transmission. So, you know, those odds are quite good. But every day after that, of course, it then it then continues to decline. Uh, and um, what we have seen, though, with this Auckland outbreak is our ability, firstly because Aucklanders did what was asked of them and um, undertook the alert level three restrictions. So they participated in those, and that stopped wider infection across Auckland, across Auckland and New Zealand. Secondly, our contact tracing and testing really did ramp up, and our, at the speed of our contact tracing system means we've been able to ring fence any of those clusters, including the, the bereavement one that happened in this case that we've just had. We were able to get onto them very quickly, even in a 2.5 alert level. So um, all, all the signs are that we've now got in place the, the, uh, all the processes we need to get on top of uh, any infections that might still pop up. That doesn't mean we won't and don't aim to still achieve uh, community elimination. Just on the previous on the managed isolation case, you've got to test everyone who was on the original flight from Nadi. Uh, no, we're not because uh, well, actually, they've already all been tested twice during their stay in managed isolation. So what we are doing is testing everyone again who was on that flight from Christchurch to Auckland. Those eighty-six people. So you won't be going back. No, they, they, they have all already been tested and will have completed their 14 days managed isolation. Some of them may still be in there because if, they, if anyone got a, a positive test late in their 14 days, they would have to stay on until they had completed at least 10 days, 10 and further days. And on internal chartered flight, uh, is Air New Zealand, have, have the flight crew been tested and um, has Air New Zealand stood down any of the, the people who were working on that flight since this positive? Well, the, uh, the flight crew are also included in the follow-up and contact tracing. We don't necessarily require them to um, 
to stand down for the 14 day period, but we do follow them up and uh, isolate them and test them as we do with everyone on so the flight. So the air crew on that flight, are they still flying across the country or are they in isolation? I don't know exactly what they're doing at the moment. They may not be uh, in, on active uh, flight duty, but we can find that out. Um, just, just, just for the sake of, just for clarity, um, the individual in question here was identified as a close contact of those positives cases that came in on those Nandi and India flights. So they were identified as potentially being in close contact and the genome sequencing is the same. So the most likely outcome is that that is the place that this individual what? has picked up an infection. Right. However, of course, for the sake of completeness, for the internal chartered flight, for all those individuals who had already gone through MIQ, already had negative tests, we are still going back and testing again all of those individuals as well. So I think it's just useful to point to what the most likely scenario is, but we are not taking anything for granted and are checking all scenarios. What do you need to see, um, what do you need to see in order to have them move to other than Just the current trajectory that we're on. So as we've always said, you know, we may well have additional cases from the cluster we've had. What we like to see is that those are cases we've identified. Um, we, for instance, proactively do double tests on those who are in isolation, so we may yet get tales of infection still. But we like to see just the current trajectory that we have and, not, and no surprises. That's ultimately what we're looking for. Um, can we potentially look at suspending flights from those high-risk countries? No, we, we haven't all the way through. Keep in mind, of course, that the whole world in different parts is now going through forms of resurgence. Some places seeing cases at higher levels than they did even from the first wave. Uh, the same obligation that exists when we first shut our borders of allowing New Zealand citizens um, to return home still exists now. We do have a robust regime to make sure that we can manage them and we've done that with 50,000 people. National Leader Judith Collins this morning said it was staggering to see you um, in a photograph and what she said um, having a lack of social distancing and I think David Seymour's had a bit of a crack as well. What's your response? Yeah, and look, all the way through on the campaign trail and even before during alert level settings, you know, I work really hard not to shake people's hands, I sanitise, I wear my mask in Auckland and I work hard to try and keep my social distance. Look, in that particular photo, I did make a mistake. I should have stepped further forward. I should have asked them to step apart from each other, and I acknowledge that. So going forward, is there any way that you're gonna- I, that? I, I, do, I do try in every circumstance. I'll often step aside in photos to try and keep distance, and that's something I'll just keep up when I'm in those places where we need to keep that distance up. Do you think it's worth sending your supporters a message now saying, hey, I know that you're keen, but in these sort of settings- Yeah, it's always helpful. I often sometimes have someone with me who's taking the photo to, to try and help me, I can't always tell how far away I am from someone. But look, I just need to acknowledge, yes, I should have moved further forward and I asked, should have asked them all to, to step away from each other as well. Does it mean you have to kind of give other people a bit of a, a long leash as well? Because it's hard. It is hard. And look, it absolutely is. And that's why we, even when we think about the different settings we have, we often have layers of protection. We don't ask people to do just one thing, you know, so on... Um, public transport in those early stages, we had distancing and masks. Um, you know, we do ask people to keep washing their hands. We, we ask people to use masks if they're in places where it's hard to keep distance. We layer up the different things that we do, often because, you know, there will sometimes be mistakes. And we know we are asking a lot of people and our systems are built for that too. You said you made the mistake, so mm. exactly how are you going to stop being in that situation? It is hard. Look, it is hard. And none of our decision making around these alert levels actually are based on the politics or the campaign. They can't be. They have to be about safety. Um, however, of course, uh, uh, I've been very rarely in Auckland. Most of my travel so far is actually being outside of that. And there will be obviously a bit more freedom for those outside of Auckland now who are campaigning. Um, but I will just keep up as I have every day of the trial, those awkward moments where I refuse to shake people's hands and try and keep distance. Yeah, yeah, so. I think they did. I mean, we do need to, we still want vigilance with testing, for instance. So if I could make a plea to all of New Zealand right now, it would be don't ever assume that your symptoms are nothing. It is very helpful to us, please, if you're unwell and you have those cold or flu-like symptoms to still get a test. That helps us maintain that level of confidence that we have contained things. Um, the second point I'd make is we will be vigilant too. So we have large scale events that are scheduled for the rest of the month outside of Auckland. 
I've asked the MB to go through what those indoor events are, proactively reach out to those organisers, make sure they're using the COVID Tracer app, that they have good details kept of those in attendance and where they're seated. So there is an accord, a, a code of conduct in place that we will be asking those large scale event operators to be um, abiding by as well. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just mop up a couple and then if Dr. Blurfield, yeah. So we've had a little bit more information about the man who tested positive the week after isolation, but do mm. we know, do you have any more information about where specifically he went? So did he go directly onto the flight, yes. to the charter flight, and then directly home after isolation? Did he go anywhere else? Did he go shopping? Yeah, so he um, did go directly from managed isolation um, uh, onto the chartered flight back to the city. He has been contact traced. My understanding is that the contacts um, have all been contacted. Um, those in who need to be in isolation are and are being tested and actually that they were relatively small is my understanding. And so the Ministry of Health is going through the usual practice of notifying all those that need to be notified. Minister, yeah. Um, will you, just back on the campaign, will you be altering the way you campaign just to take advantage of a little bit one outside of Auckland where you're sort of holding blind and back rallies, can't, can't all the stuff meetings? Actually, I, was, I do want to have a discussion. Obviously, the decision's just been made today. Um, I imagine that while um, uh, Auckland is in alert level two, um, what I anticipate is that I will be continuing to campaign in the way that I have over the past few weeks. Uh, and so we haven't had um, uh, some of those larger rallies. Um, and so I anticipate that we'll be continuing on in a similar vein that we have over the next couple of weeks. Of course, um, gatherings can, of course, happen now outside of um, outside of Auckland, though. Just what you said at the start regarding borders, does this mean that there'll be no chance of a trans-Tasman bubble or a Pacific bubble until we get the vaccine? No, 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 not at all. We have still worked. Uh, we are still working on the quarantine-free travel option for those countries where they have been free of community transmission. We prioritised, obviously, the Cook Islands. They're still in a good place. They're waiting for us to get back into a good place. Um, likewise with Australia. We haven't put any timelines on it, but so long as they get into a position where they're free of community transmission, that will be an option that could be back on the table. Yeah, so one of the things that we, well actually what I would say is that we, anyone in distress, anyone in a dangerous situation, we have obligations to allow for safe harbour. Um, and COVID does not change those obligations that we have. Um, what uh, has been identified is that there are some who are currently harboured elsewhere who may choose to harbour in New Zealand. And so um, that's something that the Ministry of Health has been looking at with NB. What we didn't want was a situation where under any other circumstance you wouldn't be able to enter into New Zealand except if you were on a yacht. We don't want to create uh, a double standard because at the moment, of course, uh, only a very small number of people are able to come through um, on flights. We didn't want to create a double standard, but we will still follow our obligations if people are in distress, of course. Um, I'll just check if there are others for Dr. Bloomfield because I do want to move on to the Harbour Bridge. Just one sneaky quick one. Yep, and then and then we'll finish with you. Um, so, is there any update on how the nurse at Jet Park was infected while working at the um, facility? So, the latest information is still that, that the infection likely happened when that nurse went in to get, um, uh, tend to or give care to to a person who was uh, who needed assessment and care and was subsequently moved to hospital. So. Uh, I don't have any detail about the clinical investigation that was being undertaken into that, but we'll, um, I'll communicate those as soon as I've got the results. And, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead, Jason. Just a real quick one. Um, do you think it's good enough um, that your officials can't provide data on how health workers were infected while they were on the job? Uh, well, what I can say is we've done a thorough analysis of health workers who were infected during the last um, wave, the first wave of, of the uh, pandemic here in New Zealand. I specifically asked for that because I wanted us to have a really good understanding of those who had gotten, who'd become infected uh, at their work. Uh, the majority of them were in aged residential care and of course we've done several uh, reviews of the aged residential care setting to help improve and uh, the uh, Infection Prevention and Control Act to protect staff as well as residents. And there's also been other specific investigations like at Waitakere Hospital. I think those will help to inform our, our provisions and our, our um, processes to protect health workers uh, right across the system, including in primary care as well as Should in those numbers maybe be public more often, like every day in the, 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 the briefings we get numbers of infected on the job as well? 
Yes, well, we, we certainly do indicate if any one of our new cases is a healthcare worker and the circumstances within which they became uh, infected. And like, just like the case of the nurse who was infected at our quarantine facility here in Auckland, we're doing a specific investigation of that. Again, it's about learning to see what else we might need to do to protect healthcare workforce. Last um, this is actually a non-COVID related question, Director General. So Mike King has issued a press release and he claims that the Ministry tried to bury the 1,000 letters can be like suicide prevention mm -hmm. report. What's your response to this, and have you read the report? I haven't read the report, but I do know the background. Uh, when this uh, piece of research was first uh, floated, uh, we worked very closely with Mike King and his colleagues to ensure that, uh, because our feeling was that this should have appropriate ethics approval, and we asked for it to be assessed by our National Ethics Advisory Committee. And we made a number of endeavours to um, support the researchers to ensure that they did have appropriate ethics approval. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, that can be construed as trying to bury the report. In fact, we were uh, very keen to see that if that research was to proceed, that it proceeded in a way that was looking after uh, the whanau of uh, people who may have left, um, left letters uh, or suicide notes, as they're called. So I don't share the same view as Mike King at the moment on that one. And it's been quite controversial, this report, to start with. Do you think there is any value in, in informing the reasons why people take their lives? Well, my understanding is, uh, well, to the substantive question, of course, and that will inform our efforts to prevent suicides, which is a really important priority for us, and we have the Suicide Prevention Office that the government has established in the Ministry of Health. There are differing views on the value of whether any analysis of suicide notes per se is likely to help us with our prevention efforts, and I think that's where the concerns were raised and why we recommended ethics approval for that piece of research. Thanks. Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. I'll now move to a quick update on the Harbour Bridge. Uh, Waka Kotahi uh, NZTA, um, bridge engineers are making great progress on both a temporary and permanent solution to fix the bridge damage. However, this is an incredibly complex process. NZTA is now confident it has a temporary solution to repair the damaged strut which will allow one extra lane in each direction to be opened on the centre span of the bridge. Uh, current plans indicate work on the bridge to install the temporary solution will begin overnight on Tuesday 22 September. This is a complex undertaking and has never been done before, so the bridge team must do extensive testing on the bridge before opening it up to live traffic. Once a temporary fix is in place, there will be real-life testing with heavy vehicles to ensure it performs to the design specifications and requirements. Of course, preceding that, though, mathematical peer review by independent experts uh, is being done in parallel to the construction of the temporary piece, and that's happening, I understand, as we, as we speak. Only then, uh, once there has been real-life testing with heavy vehicles, only then will a final decision be made about whether the temporary fix is suitable to allow the reopening of those additional lanes. Once that decision has been made, it's expected that two extra lanes on the centre span, one northbound and one southbound, will be open to the traffic later this week. So Tuesday for the repair, and then those extra lanes later this week. To enable this to happen though, the southbound lanes of the Auckland Harbour Bridge into the city will be closed overnight from Tuesday 22 September. In parallel, the team is working on a permanent repair of the damage to reopen all lanes on the Harbour Bridge. However, this work will take some time and is weeks away from installation. Repair work may not be visible on the bridge right now, however there are teams working to design, peer review the replacement parts for both the temporary and permanent solution, source materials, manufacture the plant, uh, part and plan for installation. The bulk of this time is in the design, calculation and peer review of the strut and how it will impact on the performance of the whole bridge. The new modelling is necessary because the materials of the new structure will not exactly match those that were installed 60 years ago. While the damaged component of the structure is important, there is no risk to the structural integrity or overall safety of the Harbour Bridge. And, as has already been said, the north and southbound clip-on lanes continue to be safe to use as they have their own supporting structure, which is why they've been operating as per normal. Doesn't this make us look like a tin pot country when a very innocent thing happening with a truck blowing into the side 
brings our bigger city to its knees? No, no. And I, look, I think it's important to remember that this has been described as um, a, a one in fifty, uh, a one in fifty year event. Uh, we of course do have ways to alert uh, when alert motorists when we have wind events that are potentially dangerous. Um, this was a situation where in one go, um, we had in a matter of seconds, we had a wind gust of over 120 kilometres an hour. So that is considered a, essentially a freak event. Are you satisfied with that, that it was a freak event? Or do you think that more planning should have been done in the event of an accident to be able to fix it? Uh, in days rather than weeks? Well, essentially this temporary fix will be turned around in very quick time. So we're talking a temporary fix that will open up two additional, potentially two additional lanes um, uh, after installation on Tuesday, a longer term fix being worked on as we speak um, uh, in the following weeks. Um, and I'm sure we will do some analysis as to whether or not there are further measures that can be put in place, but keep in mind, um, uh, in a matter of seconds, we had the wind speed almost double. It has so happened in those matter of seconds that there happened to be a truck with a container on it that was blown at that particular time into a load-bearing part of the, of the bridge. So the fact that we do not see these occur often means there are so many things you can do to mitigate, but this is a relatively freak event. National say that this is uh, good this is an example of why Auckland needs a second, uh, an additional harbour crossing bridge. What do you make of that? Well, that's a multi-billion dollar project, um, which on most cal most people's calculations is at least a decade away, and is not going to resolve what we have in the coming weeks with what has essentially been caused by a relatively freak event. So that needs to obviously be dealt with now. Isn't it, isn't it time to look at plans for a decade away? Oh, and, and yes, plans are being, of course, actually, you know, uh, the Council, um, NZTA, of course, have been debating and discussing the nature of a second harbour crossing, um, but the idea um, that uh, this would be resolved by that issue, this issue would be resolved by that now, I don't think anyone particularly would accept that. National has announced that the bridge will close overnight on Tuesday and not be able to reopen on the same week as the test. There's no, there's no suggestion of that, and I would imagine that NZTA will make sure that they have mitigations in place that even if they're not able to open up those two additional northbound and southbound, that we wouldn't lose our overall capacity, which of course is provided by those clip-ons which have um, uh, a different structural um, setup than those which have been damaged from this event. National says it would have a Minister for Technology. What do you think of that? Well, we of course have had uh, an aspiration, have been making investments into the sector uh, to lift the value of our exports in this space in particular. Um, we've also, uh, of course, continued to encourage through our education system the STEM subjects, removed those barriers for, for um, tertiary education, those subjects through fees free, um, invested heavily in broadband to overcome some of our black spots and those more isolated areas. We use the PGF to create um, hubs of sorts for those who may not have good digital connectivity to use those hubs. So there is absolutely an ambition from us in government to lift uh, um, the uh, additional value that can be derived by the sector. As a Labour Party, we have a policy of providing small business with digital technology vouchers to the value of $2,500, so individual SMEs can see the benefit of digital technology in their own business. National. Did, did, did National's fiscal miscalculation feel like karma to you? Oh, it, <laughs> Look, it felt like a felt to me like a situation where you didn't have an ex minister of finance in the team working through some of their fiscal plan, and I think probably what we've seen is a result of, of that. Did you do some deja vu? Probably, certainly, I imagine the minister of finance certainly did. Tomorrow is the first leaders' debate. How are you feeling ahead of that, and what are you expecting? Oh well, you'd probably need to ask the MC um, that question. Uh, look, I, I go, I'll go through exactly the same um, preparation that I did for the last debate, just making sure I spend a bit of, bit of time going over those issues that I know New Zealanders want to hear from us uh, around, whilst at the same time continuing to manage the campaign. Last time you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bill English, it's uh, Judith Collins this time. Do you have a different um, approach to different mm, leaders? No, not necessarily, actually. Um, 
Probably in part because I see the debates as being uh, an opportunity for us each as leaders to share our own vision and our own plans. So I spend a little less time thinking about sparring with the person opposite and more about just directly communicating what our plans are. And Winston Peters has been more outspoken than he was last time I asked you know, when he was outspoken um, about Labour in the region saying that you've abandoned the regions by scrapping the PGF or having your, your own version of it. Is it disappointing to you to have Winston Peters essentially putting a lot of his campaign on the fact that he's trying to distance himself from what he's calling the other side, which is the Labour Party? Oh, look, no, I, I would fully expect um, that in an election campaign, um, that even those parties that have been part of government will differentiate for the purposes of the election. For my part, it won't change how proud I am of what we did as a government. Okay, last question, Jackson. Uh, just, just back on the nationals, uh, thinking of the dollar accounting area, uh, Jim has probably just described it as entirely inconsequential. Do you have a I, I definitely don't consider $4 billion inconsequential. Okay, thanks everyone.